Hello, hello, everyone. What's going on, my people? It's been a while, right? I know, I know, I know. It's just been crazy. Y'all know what's going on. It's crazy. So um, I did a video that said, how am I doing during this time? And at the time, it was the beginning of all this, and it was okay. But now that I'm eight weeks in working from home, I'm a little anxious. Like, I'm ready to get back out there and do stuff. <laughs> I'm ready for it to be over and done, I swear to you. Um, but, you know, we have to be safe. We have to be careful. Um, but there's also some good things, even though I'm a little bit lethargic and ready to get going again with my normal life. But there's been some good things about working from home that I didn't even know that I was missing. For example, I woke up this morning to take my dog out. I have a new dog, y'all. Y'all going to love it. I took my dog out and... I was just enjoying my backyard again. Like I just didn't enjoy it before. You know, I could watch the ducks swim by. Um, the birds are out. It's springtime, so the birds are out. And I could hear them chirping and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I have a bird feeder that's empty now, and the birds come and eat, and just being able to enjoy that. And it, I didn't have time for that before because I was rushing to go to work, get up in the morning, rush, rush, rush get to work, come back, you know, come back, it's dark, you don't get to see anything. So I'm happy to be able to do that. I can take a break at lunchtime and go outside and just take a take a breather. And I've also noticed some of my plants are growing that I didn't see before because I planted a bunch of plants um, last year and some of them just grew up. They just grew up, but I didn't even know that they were perennials or some of them are annuals, which means that they, they have to be replanted every year. But they didn't take on, they didn't come up last year, so they just come up by themselves. So I'm like, wow, I didn't even remember I planted these things. So it's really nice to just enjoy your garden again, being able to be outside, get some fresh air, watch the birds, watch the ducks. Little things that I have not been able to do because life is so busy and it's just so much rush and you come home, it's dark and you leave out, it's dark and... You miss out a lot on the day, you know, because you're inside in an office sitting all day and you don't even get to see your outdoors very much. So that's the update. Now, let's get into the topic of the video, which is the business requirements document. So this is a template that I created based on most of the requirements I've written and the ones that I've seen. I put this template together and it's available for a free download on my website, just go to carolise.com, go to template section and download this template. You can get exactly what I'm gonna share with you today. And I'm gonna go through the different sections of this template and you can take it and make it your own. I'm not saying that this is a standard for how all requirements documents should be, but I, I hope that I could expose you to most of the sections that you should have and the things that you should be thinking about when you're writing your own um, requirements document. So let me just reduce the zoom on this a little. I think it's a little bit too zoomed in. Okay, that's that's good. So uh, maybe a little bit bigger. Okay, so you start off with the name of the document and then you put your feature name. So what is the feature that this document is gonna be talking about? What is the project? What are you? What is this about? And in this example, I'm gonna use hyperlinks. So I would call this, um, Adding hyperlinks to comment cards. So this is literally what this <laughs> requirement document is for. It's a very small example of what you would be writing. But the point in here I'm trying to show you is that you name it what it is. Like make sure it's very clear from just the label, just from the name what um, this is about. And then you could put your company logo. I have a version here and the date was updated because I want people to know when they open this document that they're looking at the latest thing. Um, usually this is not going to be a one-off document. There's a lot of revisions, there's a lot of changes because when you write your requirements, you know, things are gonna change, developers are gonna find things that, you know, you didn't think about and you're gonna have to make adjustments. So it's good to have versions to make sure that you're keeping up with the latest one. Oh, just to take a step back as to what the requirements document is and why you do it. Now, you would have done a number of things in your requirements elicitation process. And I have a video on how to elicit requirements, not gather requirements, because it's not lying around for you to go gather it. 
it's eliciting it's drawing out it's making sure you understand the flow you understand what the user is trying to do and you interject your system along their journey so that you can help them get to where they're trying to go right it's not for them to come use your system it's for you to help them get to where they're going so that's the mindset so once you've done all of that in your requirement solicitation and i have another video that talks more about how to understand the jobs to be done and that video i can link here and i'm going to link the other one here as well so you can go check out those videos to get the background the output of all of that is going to be in your requirements document you need to document all that you've uncovered and you need to document the solution that you're proposing that you've gotten buying for so that you can have it to reference to it'll be the handoff document that you'll give to your developers for them to go off and build it will be the source of truth for your technical writers, for your support people to know what was actually built. And then this will become the life for any future enhancements that's going to be done. So that's why your requirements document is very important. And it is the main, it's the main output that a business analyst produces. So this is a very important document that you need to know how to write if you're going to be a business analyst, right? So now that you've understood <laughs> the importance of this document, also note that this is usually done in a waterfall environment. So it's where there is heavy documentation up front. Um, if you're doing agile, then it's more of a user story. And I have a video on how to, what makes a good user story and how to write the acceptance criteria of a user story. And I'll link those videos as well. So, here we go, let's keep going. So now that you've had your cover page, you know, you can put your address, and I have this little note here, which you're gonna definitely remove, which is make sure you update the logo, because I have my logo in the footer. When you download this, you wanna make sure it's very specific to you and your organization. The first thing you need to have is your table of contents. Now you could put the word table of contents here. I just, me, I'm a, I'm a lean machine. Like everything that's needed, that's what I do. <laughs> so I just get straight to the point. <laughs> So you definitely need to have your table of contents, whether you put a label of it or not. Um, it's not a bad thing to have it. I just, less words for me is better. Um, but you need to give your audience that's going to be reading this a place to quickly access the different sections that you're going to have. So that's important. Um, if you have lots of diagrams and figures and stuff, you need to have your table of figures as well so they can see where to find what screenshot, what wireframe, what graph, what UML diagram, etc. So you also need to add that. In this case, my example is so simple, I didn't need one, so I, uh, I didn't have it, but definitely add one when you're doing it for yourself. I also have these two sections, which is revision history and approvals. Revision history is very important because so, you know, sometimes you would have revised a document and you want to make sure that each version who wrote it, because sometimes you could be collaborating on this document, it may not just be you. So that's where the revision history would be helpful. And then approval. So if you have a hierarchy of approval, it has to go to the manager, it has to go to the CEO, it has to go to, I don't know, the CIO or somebody above you, you might want to keep your approval section. If it's just you as the business analyst with your product owner, with your dev team, and you all sit in a room and agree on what needs to be built, you may not need to have a whole section on approvals. So it depends on your environment. Now we get into the different sections. So the first section is the business problem. Now I have put everything on one page just because of the presentation. I didn't want to have like a different page. I had to scroll. But definitely know that these should be separate pages, right? These should be separate pages that you will use the page to um, separate the ideas, right? So the first one is the business problem. This is your as is state. This is what is the problem that caused you to go do your elicitation and to come up with a solution. What is the problem that's being faced? What is the current state that you're trying to solve for? Now, a lot of people like to focus on the system because when you're writing requirements, it's, you know, a lot of it is system related. So for example, let's go to my banking example. Let's say that an applicant is not able to complete the application because at the end, they get a message that says, you know, they couldn't access the credit file or something like that, who knows? 
right? So that's a problem. That's as its problem. But instead of saying, oh, the credit file is not being you know, generated, that's a problem. That is a subset of the problem, but that's a very narrow way to look at it, right? So you don't want to be so laser focused on the system and what the system is not doing. You actually want to open that up and think about the end user and the people involved that's causing that ha that are having the frustration because of what the system is not able to do right so it's more of this is the, this is the reason that they're having a problem this is what they really want to do this is their user's life this is this is what they are trying to accomplish that our tool is not helping them to accomplish. So in this case, I want you to think about the end user. Think about the people. Think about the human element, not just what the system can and cannot do because the system by itself is a tool that's been used by a person somewhere. So it needs to be tied back to the human element. So in my example, I'm saying clients have expressed the need to have links on their comment card on the join canvas the join canvas is a system so that they can better reference additional information so i'm trying to say this is a human problem this is what the clients are facing the clients are trying to do something and this is why they're trying to do it they're trying to reference additional information that's the reason why they need you know the, the comment card to, to allow them to put links on it right and then i go into an example of this so this may include links to other internal sources such as their SharePoint documents or Tableau dashboards, as well as external links to websites or links to social media. So I'm trying to give the reader an example of the kinds of things that you're trying to do um, to support the problem they're having. Like I'm saying that they're not able to reference additional information. What are those additional information? What well, social media links, external website links, SharePoint documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's what I want you to do to first talk about the human element and then give a few examples of the things that you're trying to do that they can't do. And that will add some, some flesh to what the problem really is. Don't become too convoluted though. Don't go into elaborate examples and lots of, don't be like fluffy, fluffy. Nobody wants to hear the fluff right now. Nobody has time to read all that stuff. Get to the source of the problem really quickly. Okay. Currently, our system does not allow adding clickable links in the con in the comments. Today, links appear as plain text that add when added to the comment card. So this sentence is just to clarify what the limitations of the system is that I'm about to solve for. So after you've talked about the human element, you talk about the examples of what the person is trying to do, then you give the example or the situation that they find themselves in when they're using your tool. Okay, so that's the crux of your problem uh, statement. So you don't want to be too fluffy, like I said. You don't want to add in too much things that don't relate. You want to stick to the point, and you want to make it as clear and as succinct as possible. This should be its own page, and it could probably be two or three paragraphs, depending on what your problem is. If it gets over a page, it's too much. It needs to be a page. You got to break it down. You got you got to come clean. You got to you got to be more pointed. Okay, one page at most. Um, then you get into your solution overview. So your solution overview is a summary of everything that you're going to write in your requirements document. So after you've done all of your elicitation, you know, you understand the user's journey, you know the jobs to be done, you've done all this stuff, what are you doing to solve the pain that you just talked about? What will the system do to help with the problem that you just explained? And this needs to be a summary. It needs to be a summary. It needs to be very short. It needs to be succinct. It needs to be pointed. Now, there may be cases where you need to break out each, each individual point of the summary, and it might take a whole page to do that. But this should not be going on and on forever. You're not rewriting your requirements under the solution overview. It is an overview. It is a summary. It is very short to the point. So in my case, I'm saying to solve this business problem, which is the one I talked about before, we will implement the ability to add hyperlinks in the comment cards so that when the user enters a link, the system will automatically detect it and make it clickable. Right, so that's just a short paragraph. 
I am sure that you know this is not typical for most of the BRDs that's going to be written out there. There's lots of things to add in here, and there's lots of examples and stuff like that. But I caution you to not be too elaborate. Okay, just make it as short, sweet, and spicy. Get to the point because the rest of your document is going to get into the details of how you're solving exactly the problem. So you don't need to repeat that here. Then you have your assumptions. Your assumptions are things that you assume to be true in order for you to continue building on this um, in this project. So you're assuming that these things are there. So for example, if you're building an online um, portal, you're assuming that the user already has um, you know, internet connection, or you're assuming that they know how to, 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 to navigate to a website. Like you're assuming certain things that you should be safe to assume. You know, it should be safe to assume. If you're building on, um, let's say a Salesforce integration to another tool that's embedded in Salesforce, you say you're assuming that there's already an integration set up between your tool and Salesforce. So there are things that you can safely assume to be true in order for you to continue with the requirements that you're writing. The, the, the emphasis here is that you shouldn't be assuming things that could be false, right? You shouldn't be assuming things that may or may not happen. Um, you can also say, for example, if you're building an API, you could say that you're assuming that the audience is developers. So you could assume users too. Like you're not gonna assume that it's gonna be an admin person uh, or, or a front end person trying to do admin tasks, right? You can assume that these are admin users who are already familiar with the background. So you could make assumptions based on users and what their knowledge level is as well. So you write your assumptions here. Another, this should be on another page as well. Then you write your risks. So not not every uh, technical project will have risks. Sometimes the risk is at the project level, not at the development level. So this is not really a common thing for people to have, but it could happen. One of the risks, for example, that you could have is dependencies. So in order for you to build this part of the system, you need to get output from another part, and you are waiting on another team to finish this project in order for you to start this project. And so there's a risk there that you not be able to finish because you're waiting on somebody else. It could also be performance risk where you're dependent on, I don't know, some technology that, I don't know, could cause it to be disrupted. So risks are things that can cause loss. It can cause loss, it could cause injury, right? So those are the things that you need to highlight that this is something kind of outside of your control, but if it were to happen, then you'd lose in some way. For example, it could be a risk of adoption for, um, let's say, um, Facebook, for example. My mom likes to use Facebook, but do not change anything on the Facebook page. Like If they ever change a button, <laughs> she would go crazy because she's used to everything where it is. So for example, if a Facebook a project was to change where you find your messages, for example, or something like that, then she would just not be able to use Facebook, right? So that could be a risk as well, where if you do UI updates and design, that there may be a fall or a, a redu reduction in adoption or usage because people are not used to, they don't want to get accustomed to a new design. So things like that could be risks. There are things that are kind of outside of your control, but you would, you would suffer a loss if it were to happen. And then you have your in scope. In scope is just what are you actually going to do? So everything that's in your the rest of your requirements, in the functional part of your requirements, should be in scope, right? So your in scope is all of your requirements, but bucket them into big buckets, and then you put them as in scope. Don't go into too much detail here because you already have the detail in the functional requirements section. So the in scope should go. Um, hand in hand with your solution overview. So whatever you said was a solution in that summary format, now you're breaking it down a little bit more in your in scope and you put that there. So in my case, it's, it's going to be two things, which is ability to automatically detect and format a hyperlink entered in a comment card and ability to open the hyperlink when clicked. So those are just the two things that the entire requirement is going to accomplish. That's all. If I kind of skip ahead, you'd realize that there's more things detailed in the actual requirements, but I've just summarized them here in two big buckets, which is these two. Usually you'd number your, um, your in scope 
and people have different fancy ways to number things i'll get into that in a minute but you normally want to number them so that if you need to make a change and you need to talk to someone about it you can easily reference which one you're talking about when you use bullet points it's not as easy to reference so i like to stay away from um bullet points so horoscope things are the things that you are not going to do so depending on what feature you're trying to do sometimes out of scope seems obvious and sometimes it's not sometimes people assume that you're doing something because you're doing something else you need to call it out that i'm not this is not going to happen it's not going to happen um so for example if you're doing a credit application and you're going to be calling one of the credit bureaus but not the other you need to say the credit application will only um be calling experience it will not call transunion and Equifax, for example. So you need to call it out because you might say credit application approval process, and it's, and in the requirements you say call the you know the credit bureau to get the result. So people may think that they're going to be calling all three, even though you can itemize that in your functional requirements as well. What's not being called, but it's good to put all of those things here so that somebody who's just scanning your documents who's not going to go through all the details can know what you're doing and what you're not doing off the bat. All right, so that's where the out of scope comes from. And now I'm gonna jump right into my um, functional requirements. So in this case, again, it's a very simple example. It's not gonna go into a lot of depth. Um, so I have it numbered here and I have indentation. I like to go no more than three levels of indentation because if it gets too indented, it means that the requirement is too complex, you need to break it up. It needs to meet its own requirements. So not, no more than three indentations. So if I had something else, it could be, you know, Roman numerals, one, two, three, so on and so forth. But please don't make it so far indented that there is just, it's just way too much. All right. And then you number your functional requirements. So people have a lot of fancy ways to number things. Yes. FR001, BRD001, and so on and so forth. That's fine. If your company uses some kind of numbering, nomenclature or something consistent with that, that's fine. No problem. Um, but I like to keep it simple to the point. The most important thing is to be straightforward. You must be straightforward in your requirements. No fluff, no fluff at all. No ands and conjunctions and uh, opinions. You don't. Nobody needs your opinion at this point. This is this is what I want you to build. When the user does this action, I need the system to respond in this exact way. That's it. The time for opinions and what you think can happen and how it could go, that time has passed. That was in your elicitation. That was in your buying discussion. That was when you were talking to the different teams to understand what their requirements were. At this point, when you're writing your requirements, you should know what you want to happen. This is not a discussion at this point, except for when you present it and then you know, the development team might have a change that they want to make or you know, some manager have a change. But you start off the document proposing something telling them something and let them challenge you if there's a problem okay but don't don't ask questions in here don't be wishy-washy don't be unsure don't be you know fluffy this is not the place to be fluffy okay so in my example i like to give a scenario so when the user does this action i want the system to do this this action or this result and I want it to be very clear. User system doesn't user action system. So in the user world, user story world, we have a format. In the requirements world, we also have a format. So you could also start with the user must be able to, and you can put what the user does, or when the user does this, the system does this. So you can change up the format. The point is that it needs to be clear, succinct, and you need to be making sure that you are you are as clear as possible in each of your requirements. Also, don't make it into a big fluffy blob. Don't make it into each of these into a paragraph. Make it as simple as possible, two sentences or three sentences the most. We don't need paragraphs here. Nobody has time to be reading all this stuff. It needs to be spaced out like this as well so you can scan it easily. You can refer to it easily, you can scan it easily. So for example, this one says, when, a use, when the user enters text with a prefix of www, http, or https on a comment card on the join canvas, the system must detect that a hyperlink has been entered and display the text using a hyperlink style. 
C style guide. So in this case, I am assuming that the developers already have access to the style guide. You could also put a link to the style guide here. Um, and you're putting what the user is doing on what and what the system needs to do as a result, right? So it's, it's very to the point. I also have this um, additional step which says, if the user entered a link with no prefix and only has, for example, a dot domain name suffix, such as carolise.com, that's without these um, prefixes. The system must also detect that a hyperlink has been entered and display the text using the hyperlink style. So I could have easily combined this with this, but for the sake of clarity, I want to make sure I call out an, an anomaly and make sure I explain what that anomaly is in the requirement. I don't want to make it too long. Like I didn't want to put this with this and it becomes this big paragraph. So you have to be careful too because the developers need to read it quickly and understand it quickly and make an assessment quickly to estimate. And you don't want to give them too much stuff for them to be mind boggled, right? Just make it as clear as possible. If it becomes too much, you need to break it out, break it out so they can see each thing individually and assess them individually. And then the other three examples are also very simple. When a user clicks on a hyperlink from the comment card, the system must open the link in a new tab, right? So that's just another functionality thing. Hyperlinks will only consist of standard HTML and will not need to support application parameters. So this is something that could have come up in your discussion with Dev in the first round where they say, oh, you know, we have application parameters as well, blah, 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 blah. You can call that out. This could be a directly a development suggestion. It might not be something that you'd ever hear from an end user, right? When the user hovers over a hyperlink on the comment card, a hover over must show the text. Hold the key plus um, click to follow external link. So in this example on the join canvas system, you're already editing. So when you click on the comment card, you're editing something. So in this case, it's saying if you're already editing, the only way for you to actually open the link is to do some fancy key combinations, right? And so you make that a part of your requirements. So this is how you kind of break down your in scope into detailed requirements. Always remember when you're writing your requirements to cover things like defaults, what are the system defaults that uh, you'd want to have? Cover things like error handling. What happens if it doesn't go well? What's the error that you're gonna expect to show? How should the system react? Cover things like when there's no data, what happens in the, in the process when nothing is there? There's no table information. It's a brand new account, it's a brand new application, it's a brand new whatever, and there's no data to show. How does your, your requirement handle that? And also, what if there's too much data? What if there's like lots of data, like thousands and thousands of records? How does it handle that? So those are some of the things that sometimes we forget, but you should always make sure that your requirements are handling those as well. Once you finish with your functional requirements, then you move on to your non-functional requirements. Now, because my example is so simple, um, I don't really have <laughs> any non-functional requirements to report, but I put the section here so you don't forget it. The non-functional requirements are things that are not going to be actively built by the developer, but they should keep in mind, right? They should, they should do something to make sure these things happen. For example, performance, to make sure it performs well. That's not something that you can specify in your requirements, but it's something that the technical team should keep in mind whenever they're building. Um, things like, I don't know, recovery and backup, and other things that are like really dev specific um, to make sure that they, they do that as well. And then you come to the end where you have your appendices and this is where you put your charts, your graphs, your diagrams. And this in, in this case, I have my mock-up of what the comment card would look like. Um, and then we have our um, technical design notes. So this could be something that technical team might wanna itemize. They might say, well, the CSS needs to be transitional or whatever technical thing that they need to be reminded of when they're building out this, these requirements. And then you have the estimation points, like how much story points, how much man hours is it gonna take to, to do this requirement. So after all the discussion, these are good places. It's a good place to note whatever the outcome is when you present this to your development team. And then I like to put my decision section here because some people put it at the beginning where, where I had the um, this, but sometimes it's only after you've gone through all of the detailed requirements that you have some decisions that are being made, right? So I like to itemize those and be able to, 
to make a note at the end what decisions were that changed stuff. You could put it at the beginning too, but that's just my preference. One more thing I want to say is that the mockups and wireframes and so on, especially the mockups, I've heard from my development team in different uh, projects I've worked on that they would prefer to see it in line with the actual requirements. So if I'm talking about comment cards on requirement one, they want to see the, the mockup beside it so they can see it and make that assessment at the time when they're reading it as opposed to have to scroll all the way to the bottom into the appendices and maybe there are more than one mockups and try to find that one and then scroll back up and try to figure out which one it related to. You know, especially if you have a very long document, that might be too much. So that's some of the things I've heard. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and like and check out my website to download this um, template that you can use as a starting point for your requirements. Again, writing your requirements document is a core functionality of a business analyst, and you need to make sure that you're doing it well, right? So I hope this was useful for you to get some overview as to what it is and how it does, how it, how it works, and um, some of the things to consider when you're writing your own requirements. So remember to subscribe and like the video, and share the video, right? Share the information, it's, it's free, so share it. Okay, so I will see you all next time in the next video. Take care. Bye.